Today is Friday, and that means that we have a special guest because every Friday we are bringing on a scientist. And today's topic is volcanology, and we're super excited to have Sam Mitchell come on as a volcanologist. But before we do, I want to give a quick welcome to those of you who are watching live. Hello to Owen from California, to Hayden from South Carolina, Deepa from Montreal, Elizabeth from South Dakota. I said that twice, didn't I? She's extra welcome. That's, <laughs> that's the way these things work. Walker from Tensus, Princess Perfect from New Hampshire. We are super excited to have you here. And I'm curious, is anybody watching from the UK? Because I know I know of one person who's watching from the UK. Our, our guest, Sam, is from the UK. Yep. He is. We're going to bring him on in just a minute. But before we do, I want to, and I hope this doesn't embarrass him, I want to tell you just a little bit more about him. And also mention, if you are on Instagram, our guest today has a fantastic Instagram page that is all about science communication and the field work that happens with volcanoes. And so I would say check that out because it's a fantastic page to follow, beautiful images, and a lot of really cool facts just about how incredible this world is around us and the awesome types of research and scientific communication that is happening right now and today. So Anything you want to add? I'm going to say that we reached a big milestone yesterday on YouTube. We, we reached 30,000 subscribers, Woohoo! which is awesome because in the first three years of the channel, we only had like 7,000. Yeah, we, we've had a lot of growth so. lately. And that has really been a credit to you guys who are watching Quarantine, this show that actually I'm trying not to say the word Quarantine because you someone told me. I know, yeah. I did. Um, for a lot of school students who are using school Chromebooks, for some reason, YouTube is blocking our math and science show, but it's not blocking painting with a scientist, which is a bit of a mystery. And someone suggested that maybe the word that I'm not saying, since it sounds like <laughs> quarantine, maybe the algorithm is thinking that you it's just said, You just said the even worse word now. I, I know. Okay. So who knows? We're trying to figure it out and we're contacting YouTube to see if we can get that fixed. Um, we'll, we'll let you know. But that's enough. That's enough random stuff. I'm super excited to bring on our guest. Everyone give some claps in the chat for Sam Mitchell. Hi, Sam. Hi there, Hi there everyone. My name is Sam Mitchell. As Jenny already said, I'm a volcanologist based, so, in, based in the UK. It's good to be on. Oh, it's great to have you here. What time is it in the UK right now? It is currently 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And it is 8 o'clock in the morning, our time. So we've got morning show on this half of the screen and at late afternoon show on the other half, yep. which I just <laughs> pointed the wrong ways. I have to say being a volcanologist sounds like one of the most exciting jobs someone could possibly have. And I know there are several kids clapping for you in the chat who are saying, this is what I would like to do when I grow up. How did you get to be a volcanologist? How did you get into science? That's great. Okay, it's really good to hear that so many people keen and interested in volcanoes. It really is a really exciting and fascinating subject. How I got into science, I'd, I'd always been interested in science as a, as a kid, but I really, really got interested in volcanoes and earthquakes and tsunamis and all those other kinds of natural hazards in high school. Um, for a, an event that happened in 2004, I'm sure you remember and uh, maybe not for some of the younger folks in there, but in 2004, there was a really, really big earthquake off the coast of Indonesia that produced Ooh. a huge tsunami that went all over the Indian Ocean. And that was really my first entry point into the world of earth science and just how awesome and powerful the planet can potentially be. So from then, I started going to the library and taking out books, reading more about the subject, and slowly that fascination geared towards volcanoes. So throughout high school, I was really, really fascinated and started to read more about volcanoes, where they were across the world, and what, what, what can we do to understand them? What actually is a volcanologist? So that was my, my goal. Once I'd seen that, I saw these scientists who were out there studying volcanoes and traveling the world. So I then went and did a geology degree at university. So for those of you thinking about, oh, how do I maybe become a volcanologist? Uh, there's a range of different paths you can come into volcanology from. You can come through geology, earth science, and uh, some people actually come from chemistry and physics and even engineering backgrounds uh, and even computer science because we mm. use all of these topics. And that's one of the gr amazing things about volcanology is it's this place in science where all these other subjects 
come together and we'll talk more about that in the chat, but there's a bit of biology, chemistry, physics, geography, even a bit of history. There's maths, there's computer science, and you don't have to be amazing at all of those things. You can just be good in some of them or have a really good understanding of all of them and you can contribute and be involved in volcanology in so many different ways. I love that. And I have to say, no matter what area of science that you're in, it seems like you're going to need chemistry at some point to be able to understand what's yeah. really going on, right? Yeah, exactly. Particularly when it comes to understanding the planet, because everything is, it, is produced down below, as you've talked earlier on in the week about the mantle and the core and the crust and how plate tectonics work. And all that movement, all that physical stuff, it's all physics. But then when you look at the really small scale stuff and you start looking at the minerals and the crystals and the melt and different types of volcanoes, that's all coming down to the chemistry mm -hmm. of this. So it's a place where all these different science subjects meet perfectly. So if you like all areas of science and wonder, well, which one do I choose? How do I choose between these amazing subjects? Then think about earth science because it's a place where they all combine. I love that. I love that. So you got <laughs> your degree in geology. Um, did you have yep. like a specialization in volcanology then, or did you have to, did you have to go on to more school? Tell us what happened after you got your geology degree. Okay. So during my last year of my geology degree, I got a bit more involved in research. So that was where I really started to be able to go into that volcanology kind of background. I was at a place that had a lot of really good volcanologists in the research department. So I was able to get involved in some of the research happening there and then. So a lot of the research I did in that final year was more lab, was more based in the lab. And we were doing experiments to try and recreate volcanic plumes inside mm -hmm. the lab. So really, we were creating these plumes that were meters and meters high uh, using these uh, mechanical shoots. So it was a bit of engineering, a bit of physics, but it was still all about volcanoes. Uh, but after I finished that degree, which was still in geology, I went to, I flew all the way from the UK went all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, all the way across America, into the Pacific, and to Hawaii, which is where I then did a PhD in geology that specialized in volcanology. Ooh, that's a great place to do research in volcanology. And when, when were you in Hawaii? Were you in there? Were you in Hawaii when they had the big eruption a couple of years ago? Yes, that was during the final few months of my PhD, actually. Oh, so wow. So it made for a a very interesting time, but a very distracting time. <laughs> I had a, I had a lot of writing to do during that time to finish my PhD, but there was still this, um, this huge eruption happening that Hawaii hadn't seen something of that like for um, a good few decades. So it was a very interesting time to be in, be in Hawaii. Uh, um, but whilst I was there, I wasn't just studying volcanoes in, in Hawaii. I was also studying volcanoes at the bottom of the ocean um elsewhere around the pacific so that's actually where my area of research is i do do some work on volcanoes on land but most of it is actually about volcanoes at the very bottom of the ocean at the very bottom of the ocean that is so cool and i know that we talked a little bit about mid-atlantic ridges earlier this week but just in case some of our viewers haven't heard of this let's talk about the idea of there being volcanoes underwater because i think to some people that sounds a little surprising like how can you have a volcano yeah. underwater of course, yeah, you would think th this would just cool straight away. How can you have lava and magma down there? But actually, when you think about the, if you think about a map of the world, two thirds of the planet is covered in is covered in by ocean, and so it's therefore covered by oceanic crust. So you get these mid Atlantic ridges, subduction zones, and sometimes subduction zones can happen at two oceanic plates. So you can have subduction zones there. So you can get these really explosive volcanoes. I'm at a subduction zone, but they're still underwater. And actually, there are more volcanoes, many, many more volcanoes on the seafloor than there are on land. Oh, that's fascinating. We're Which having a really, really amazing. We're, we're having a some really great, amazing. <laughs> that really, it really is. We're having some great questions come in with the chat. But what okay. I'm going to I'm going to do is I want to save a, most of our Q and A for later. But real quick, mm -hmm. let's just talk about about magma and how volcanoes are formed. So my first question for you is, is magma under pressure? Like if you broke through the Earth's crust at any point on the planet, would magma immediately shoot up? Oh, okay. So it depends if there's magma within the crust. 
So you, you wouldn't break the crust necessarily and the mantle would come straight out as such. You would have to have pockets of melt quite shallow within the crust. So within a few kilometers or a few miles of the Earth's surface. So if you were to crack it, then you can actually tap regions of melt. Uh -huh. And that's actually happened before in drilling projects. It's only happened oh, really? once. Tell um, us about yeah, this. Yeah, there's a really, really cool story that happened in Iceland. So Iceland's a very, very volcanically active country that sits on a hotspot and also on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So it's a very, very active place. And because of the volcanic activity there, there's a lot of interest. Well, most of their energy comes from geothermal power. So they're using the heat, physical heat within the crust that comes off of these bodies of magma to provide energy. Uh, for the country and so that one of the ideas was to drill deeper and to try and access more of these higher energy geothermal power sources and one of the projects accidentally tapped into a really really shallow body of magma that was sitting about two kilometers down um into into the crust and it actually produced a plume that came out of the the drilling well oh my goodness i hope they were able to like realize what was happening and get get away in time. Yeah, but yeah, they were. But as you say, they had released that pressure by tapping into that system. And that is how, going back to the original question, how yeah. magma actually forms. A really good analogy for imagining magma is think about a bottle of Coca-Cola. So if you, if you have a sealed bottle of Coca-Cola and you shake it up and then you leave it, nothing really happens, but you've got all this gas that's dissolved inside the liquid but it's only when you actually take the top off that all that gas, that carbon dioxide comes rushing out of the Coke bottle. And Ooh. that's a great way to think about how volcanoes erupt. You have this liquid and this gas under pressure. And then when you create a place where the pressure valve is turned off and you open it up to the atmosphere, all those gases are driven out of the liquid and they cause the Coke to erupt everywhere. So you get the gas erupting out, but it takes some of the liquid with it. And that's one of the main reasons why you get magma erupting is you get this liquid and you get this gas. I like that analogy a lot. And it makes yeah. me think that I've, I, and I don't think that I've been using the term magma correctly. I think I've been using it interchangeably with, with mantle. Um, so let, maybe let's, let's talk about those terms really quick. And then let's talk about how volcanoes work because I think some people have the idea that a volcano is like a direct line all the way down into the, the hot layer of mantle. But that's not right. The truth, right? No, it's not the case. It's uh, like many things on the planet. It's very, very complex. So there are many different ways that it can behave across the planet. But that's going back to the original, uh, so one of the earlier questions you just said: the mantle versus magma. Yeah. So the, what we would really think about as magma is more what's being taken out of the mantle and being put into the crust. So magma is a mixture of three things. It's solid, liquid, and it's gas. So the mm -hmm. solid for, um, fraction of that is crystals. Now we've seen some of that earlier in the week and we've seen these minerals that you've been looking at and the physical solid structure of those are crystals. So that's one component. You have the liquid component, which is melt. So that is just molten rock that has come out and has been tapped from the mantle. And then, as I said earlier, you have these gases that when they're under a lot of pressure, they're dissolved in the melt. But when it's released or when they're shallower, the gas comes out in gas bubbles. And those are the main gases are water, carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide. And even in there, you get small amounts of chlorine and even fluorine. So Ooh. there's some really, really nasty, really yeah. nasty gases within magma. Things you do not um, want to be breathing. Yeah, exactly, which is why when we're doing uh, work in the field around volcanoes, usually we have to wear uh, protective masks and eye gear uh, to protect us from those sorts of things. There's a, a great example there. So there's a, a picture next to a, an active volcanic plate and we're using the hard hat. And then we've got a special respirator and also some eye goggles to protect us from these really nasty gases around volcanoes. That looks like quite the respirator because you, you really have to make sure that you're you're filtering out everything, right? Everything. It's one of those where if you were to take it off immediately, your 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 nose starts to sting, your mouth seizes up, your eyes are stinging as well. So it's if you're getting really close, it can be really 
yeah, <laughs> really quite an experience <laughs> breathing in the volcano again. So you don't want to be there. Is is magma the same as lava? Are those two terms interchangeable? So the best way to think about lava versus magma, when it's under the ground and still in the crust, it's called magma. And when it's erupted out of the crust and onto the surface, it's called lava. So they are exactly the same thing. But we use that term usually to describe lava, what we see on the surface, and magma when it's inside the storage region. So within that magma chamber or this system, this complicated network. Um, and that's a really important point as well for thinking about magma chambers. There's a lot of pictures out there you might see where it looks like this bubbling cauldron of liquid that has this big um, roof above it and all this space. But it's actually a lot more complex than that. It's more like layers, um, lots and lots of layers stacked on top of each other that go from the crust down towards the mantle. And as you get shallower and shallower, there's more melt. So they start off quite solid. Um, and then slowly as you get higher and higher and closer to the surface, there's more melt and some of the gases start to come out. And that's the stuff that we're tapping for these eruptions. It's the stuff at the top of this stacked layer of small like magma lenses in the crust. That's fascinating. So yeah. I, I want to be sure we have time for a few stories. And I will say mm -hmm. to those who are in the chat asking questions, because I'm seeing such great questions, um, quick shout out to my, my helpers here, Science Mom Emily and Science Mom Liza are on YouTube and they are gathering questions. And Science Mom Krista is on Facebook and she's gathering questions as well. So we are gonna be collecting questions and we'll do a Q and A, more of a Q and A at the end. But now that we've talked a little bit about the structure of volcanoes and magma versus mantle, we would love to hear some stories from Sam about research that he's done. So I'm gonna okay. pull um, some images because we've got some good pictures to share. And Sam, if you could just tell us a few stories about what a volcanologist actually does. And I'd also love for you to talk about your favorite part of your job. And actually maybe before okay. we do stories, tell us, are there any common misconceptions people have? When you tell people you're a volcanologist, are there things that a lot of people have wrong that you hear over and over, misconceptions? Okay, yeah, I think one of one of the biggest misconceptions maybe about a volcanologist is that we are always stood at the edge of an active volcano, dangling off a rope, <laughs> doing something really, really dangerous. But most of the time, that's not actually true. Yes, we do you can do field work and go to these active volcanoes to take measurements and to take samples. But most of what we, most of what some people do is actually back in the lab or even on a computer. So when I was saying earlier that it's all these different areas of science that come together, for the most part, most of the work is done back in the lab or back analyzing data. So it's the, but there are some people who, um, they're more focused in the field. Aspects. So they might be people who work for volcano observatories. So they're the ones going out, taking measurements, uh, looking at things like how the ground inflates around volcanoes, measuring the gases that are coming out, taking samples from the field or recording small earthquakes that might tell you where magma is moving under the ground. That's great. So I, yeah. So that misconception, I think volcanologists do all, all sorts of things and no volcanologist is the same. People work on different volcanoes. There are very few volcanologists that know everything about every, I don't think there are <laughs> any <laughs> volcanologists that know everything about every volcano all across the world. Some of us like to pick uh, particular ones and really focus on the studying of a particular volcano. Other, other of us likes to take concepts maybe, like certain areas, maybe it's the theory of plate tectonics or it's what magma physically does when it erupts. And rather than working on a specific volcano, we think about the ideas and the physics and the chemistry that all make that work. I like that. And you you mentioned earlier that your PhD, <coughs> excuse me, your PhD was done in Hawaii. So studying a very active volcano and that a lot of your work has been with underwater volcanoes. So let's Tell us, tell us some stories now about research experiences you've had with relating to underwater volcanoes. Okay, great. Yeah, so uh, as, as you just said, uh, one of the main areas of my research is studying these volcanoes at the bottom of the ocean. And it's a very different area and different, a very different way to do field work. Because when you do field work on land, you pack your equipment, you 
get on the plane to where you need to go or you drive in your car, however close you are to the volcano, and you're there, you set up and you can do your field work. When we're going out to sea to do these kinds of expeditions, they are a huge, huge monumental task. And to do this, we actually have to go out on research vessels. So I think I've got a picture there. I think it's number six. Yes. Yeah, so this is just a, a picture of one of the research vessels. So it's not like a, a big cruise ship liner or it's not like a sailing yacht. It's somewhere in the middle. So, for example, this was an expedition we did in 2015, so about five years ago now, where we went to go and study a volcano off the coast of New Zealand or halfway between New Zealand and the islands of Tonga. Mm -hmm. And we were out there for nearly four weeks uh, studying a volcano that was a mile below the, the ocean surface. A mile below? Course, so so how did you get there? Below. Exactly, yeah. So we can't dive <laughs> that deep. We can't physically go down and pick the rocks off off the seafloor. So what we have to do is we have to take submersibles, submarines with us. So I think there's a really good picture in number four. Here we go. So that's a that's a picture of us deploying one of these yeah. submarines off the side of the ship. And then the submarine will go down to the seafloor a mile deep and that will be able to collect samples for us at the bottom of the ocean. Now these submarines don't actually have people in them. So there are different types of submarines we can use. You can have ones that have people in them where the person is physically going down collecting samples. You have ones that we can operate from the ship. I think there's a really good picture of the control room in number three. Yeah. Yeah. This is what these control rooms look like for these submarines. So they've got all these cameras on them so that we can look in all directions around the submarine. We can see exactly what it's seeing from the front, from the back, from the bottom, from the sides. And then we've got all the navigational equipment as well. So we know exactly where the submarine is. Uh, we know if it's everything's behaving okay, how long it's been down there. And we collect data about the water as well. Did you happen to so, see any, any surprising animals when you were taking your submarine down, like a giant squid or anything like that? I, I just, I gotta um, add. <laughs> yeah, not when we were usually going down, you usually don't see anything for a while on the camera. You just see blue. Uh -huh. that there is nothing else to see and then all of a sudden the ocean floor opens up to your cameras and you start seeing everything on this expedition we were studying a volcano that had, that had only just erupted about well about three years before less than three years beforehand so we were there fairly soon after a very big eruption so we weren't expecting to see much life maybe no. some maybe some bacteria maybe some shrimp feeding off of some of the hydrothermal vents down there but we saw sharks, we saw squid, we saw all these kind of like horseshoe uh, kind of sea slugs. There was all sorts down there. And it was really oh, wow. interesting to yeah. think and just how quickly that area had recovered biologically. Even just three years after a really big eruption, there were these beautiful like meter long sharks. Wow. And the deep purple, um, deep purple squids down there, we weren't sure exactly what they were but we collected all the images and really fascinating wildlife that is fascinating places. i i want to hear um oh just a little bit more about wait, wait, oh, I, sorry i, I, I was confused just... I, I missed this is yeah. there a person in the submersible or is it entirely remote controlled and uh, not not this one uh, this you can have the human operated ones and they have been down to hydrothermal vents and to places where lava is actively erupting uh, this but this one was like a, a a remote one so it's like a big robot and you're controlling the yeah. robot and you control it yeah we have special technicians wow. on board the ship that are controlling it and it's got there's a good picture in number seven it's got these special arms on the front of it and it's got almost like this utility belt of equipment so what you can see here is the submersive the submarine we were using actually going to collect one of its instruments so that's a small probe a heat cool. probe that we put into this ash so this is the seafloor at the edge of an uh, at the edge of a, a volcanic crater, and it's covered in ash. But it, there's, it's still hot around the area. It wasn't actively erupting, but the area is still there's still gas being produced, and the area is still hot. So the submersible has these little arms with these claws on the end, and what it's able to do is pick up the equipment it needs, put it onto the seafloor, leave it for a bit, come back, pick it up, put it back in its belts. And then it can come back up to the surface and we can collect the data. 
That is really cool. And I want to hear just a little bit more about this eruption, because I think usually when we think of an underwater volcano, we think of, you know, a little crack under the ocean and a hot little lava coming out and that you're going to end up with, yeah. you know, black, black lava rocks. But you said that yeah. there was a huge layer of ash. So we're talking more like an ash fall. But how does an ash fall happen underwater? Yeah, exactly. So if the eruption is large enough, you can still produce eruptions that are very similar to on land. If you think about some of the really big eruptions we've we've seen in the past that have maybe produced pumice or these huge ash falls, it can still happen under the ocean if the eruption is powerful enough and you're ejecting enough material into the water quick enough. And it's still a very active area of research. We still don't, we've still not vis visually seen these eruptions on the seafloor um, in, in person, these really powerful explosions. But what we have seen is evidence for them on the surface. So have you got that piece of pumice? With yeah. you. Oh, the Fantastic. pumice. The, wet pumice. Yeah, the, the piece of pumice. Yep. So, so earlier on in the week, what was it, what was something you showed with the pumice? What was it, it able to do? It floats in water. In fact, um, oh, I thought I had a yeah. little container of water here, but I lost. Oh, that's it. okay. You drink it. <laughs> I drink it. <laughs> but it does. You sit, sit this in water, and it floats. And it floats. So, if you have these eruptions at the very bottom of the ocean and they erupt out lots of ash and lots of pumice, and these pumice are filled with those bubbles of gas that we were talking about earlier. All of the pumice, or most of the pumice, comes to the surface. Wow. So you can actually see it, and that's happened very recently as well. So this eruption that I was studying was in 2012, but there was an eruption in August last year. I think there was another one in June last year. There was one in 2018. And we're seeing these more frequently now because we have much better satellites taking images of the oceans. And um, there are ships passing around some of these areas. So we're able to identify these big eruptions that are happening on really, really deep in the ocean. We know they've happened because we can see huge areas of pumice floating on the surface of the ocean. That and is that's really, amazing. Really cool. Wow. So this, and it can transport those pumice blocks thousands of miles away from the volcano. That is so amazing. This, yeah, this eruption was erupting pumice from near Tonga, and the pumice was washing ashore in Australia. <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of miles away, and they were wa washing up still at least a year after the eruption. Wow. So I, I've got to ask, um, when you have an eruption like that, is it big enough that it's going to create a tsunami? Or do you sometimes have eruptions that are putting pumice up, but we're not feeling them? You know, you're not getting earthquakes or tsunamis going around. Because I would think that this is an eruption we should have heard about on the news, but I don't remember hearing anything about these underwater eruptions. <laughs> I wish there was more of them on the news. <laughs> <laughs> They're really, really fascinating. But um, no, I'm just thinking about that for a second. You can get tsunamis that are generated by underwater volcanoes but usually it's because of a landslide hmm. at the volcano itself so as uh, when you were when you've described tsunamis in the past the way a tsunami is generated is you have to have a large amount of water physically moved very quickly and so that can happen in an earthquake for example if you get two plates or a fault and one of them's uplifted all of the water around the area gets moved about and displaced. But for a volcanic eruption, when you've got lots of small amounts of material, there's not a sudden enough change to maybe produce mm. a tsunami. You might see some change at the surface or large bubbles bursting and rippling, but you would really need maybe the collapse of the side of a volcano. So a landslide that would move all of this material somewhere else that would then allow water to move into that space and water there gets lifted up. So in that case, you can get volcanic tsunamis. Interesting. Math Dad got me some water so that we can show how our pumice sure. rock floats. So Yeah, and that's because of all those bubbles inside. Now, depending on how well connected all those bubbles are, sometimes the pumice can float, which is why you find ash and pumice on the seafloor as well as on the surface of the ocean. So some so of it, it, some of it will go up to the surface, and then if if it doesn't have enough air bubbles, it will go up and then settle back down. Can can the air yeah, bubbles so, be filled with water? Like if I submerged this in water for a couple of days, would it eventually sink? It might. 
I don't know enough about that particular pumice, but <laughs> if I saw it in person, I might be able to tell you more. But if you left that to sit for a few days or weeks, you'll just have to wait and see. It all depends on the individual pumice and how well connected those bubbles are. So if, the, you're, as you say, if, oh, the if they're are isolated well, and in the middle yeah. of the pumice and water can't get in, then it will just keep floating and eventually make exactly. its way to Australia, even though it came out of a volcano thousands of miles away. Exactly. That's a fascinating. Yeah. All right. Tell us a little <laughs> bit more about, about underwater volcanoes and some of the field work that you've done. Cause I think we have a couple other pictures that would be neat to showcase. Um, okay. So we looked at that one. Um, so one of the, the other things we do as well as taking these submarines down to video and image the volcanoes, we can also bring samples back up onto the ship. So these submarines have like a platform out in the front of them and it uses these arms that are called manipulators to pick up rocks off the seafloor, hold them tight, put them in little buckets, put a lid on, and we can bring these samples from a mile deep all the way back onto the ship. So I think there's a picture in number, uh, maybe number two. Here we go. There we go. So that's an example of a huge rock uh, that we brought up right from the surface of the ocean right onto our ship. And it was, how, how big was it? I'm trying to remember. It was about five feet wide, about two feet tall, and about three feet thick. So this is a huge piece of rock. And your, and was, oh, and your submersible was able to carry that up? Yes. Yeah, so we actually, we removed some of the equipment out from the front and it basically, we basically hugged it. <laughs> we used the arms of the submersible, wrapped them around the samples, so held it down and then brought this entire rock to the surface. Neat. And once you have so, the rocks on the surface, you can analyze them to learn more about the volcano. Exactly. So all of these samples that we collect from the expeditions, we can then bring back with us. So I think the, the number first image you were just showing. So what you can see in that picture is <laughs> all lots of white buckets all wrapped up with tape. So all those buckets are filled with samples that we collected during this expedition. And then all of those samples will get transported back to the lab and then we'll be able to analyze these rocks. So we'll make um, uh, small thin sections of them. So we'll cut them, we'll take a section of the rock, polish it down really, really, really fine. So you're able to see through it and then we'll put it under special microscopes and we can actually look at the really fine details, like down to, you know, the, the width, of a, width of your hair down to the micron scale. So that's a millionth of a meter. And so we can look, yeah. And tell us just a little bit more about the minerals that are in, that are in lava, because lava that comes out like, um, like this picture here that you shared with me, you know, this yeah. ropey lava that comes out super thick like molasses and folds over itself as it's drying. This is so different from lava that comes out in an ash fall where you get these layers of okay. ash that are, that are being deposited and what makes the difference between those two types of lava or those two types of eruptions? Yeah, so those are really at the opposite ends of each other. That's your proper, you've got these main two main terms we use in volcanology, which is explosive and effusive. Now explosive is fairly explanatory. Explosive is the stuff that happens in explosive eruptions, but effusive we use to describe the lava flows. So it's not erupting explosively, it's not fragmenting and breaking apart, but it's just gradually erupting out. This can be fast or it can be slow, but that's the overall term. So for the effusive stuff that we see there, those are um, lava flows from Hawaii that are made of basalt. And on the other side, yeah, so that's an example there of the lava lake that used to be um, in Hawaii till about two years ago. And this type of lava is called basalt. It's the hottest type of lava, the top type of magma and lava that we see on the planet today. And that can reach temperatures of around 1200 uh, degrees C. You might have to do the Fahrenheit conversion for me. <laughs> Celsius around interior. Well, we'll stick with Celsius. Okay, I think it's around 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> Super hot. So a lot hotter. Yeah, a lot hotter than any oven. Um, so at that end, you get this really, really hot, runnier, type of magma that produces these, that can produce these effusive eruptions. It can erupt explosively as well, but usually we see lava erupting as lava flows that can run really, really fast. So these 
when these lava flows are really, really hot, they can uh, go a lot faster than when they cool down. So mm. as they cool down, interact with the air, they'll slow, they'll slow down, they'll go from yellow to orange to red, and eventually they'll cool into a black solid lava material. And that's made up of crystals, glass, and these leftover pockets from the bubbles that were inside. On the other side of things, with the ash fall, what you get is you get magma erupting out so quickly and it depressurizes so fast that the bubbles rapidly expand and all of the melt that was around them just gets fragmented and blasted apart as the magma erupts out of the volcano. So rather than it erupting out as a liquid with lots of bubbles and crystals in, it erupts out as fragments of material that we call tephra. So everything mm. that comes out of a volcano in this case is called tephra and that includes ash, uh, pumice, uh, big volcanic bom bombs, big blocks of material that get erupted out. Would, so in that picture- that you, Oh, would, would Mount St. Helens be a good example of this type of eruption? Because people Mount have probably Helens. seen like that famous photo of that huge ash, you know, like it looks like a huge gray cloud just bursting out of the side of the mountain. Exactly, yeah, that's a great example of an explosive eruption um, is Mount St. Helens in 1980. Uh, but Mount St. Helens also produced more effusive style eruptions in a period of 2004 to 2008. So there was a mm. big lava dome that grew inside the main crater. So it just shows that one volcano can produce both very, very explosive eruptions and then very, very slow moving lava, like lava flow and lava dome producing eruptions, all from the same volcano. And what, what made the difference? Why did Mount St. Helens do that explosion in 1980 and then had more, you know, syrupy, effusive eruptions later? Yeah, so it, it all comes down to the, the chemistry um, and, and the physics, <laughs> as we said before, of that magma down below. So all these gases that are trapped inside the magma will determine how quickly it might erupt out. So depending on how quickly that system depressurizes or how crystalline it is as well. The more crystals that grow, the more sluggish the magma becomes. So the more gas that's potentially in there, the more potential it has to erupt explosively. But maybe if there's less gas and more crystals, it might behave as a thicker, more sluggish material that it just erupts out slowly. It also depends on how quickly the system is being recharged. So you've got, the material coming up from much deeper uh, providing magma into these systems in the crust and depending on how quickly those systems get refed with magma might control how quickly it might then erupt out as well. Awesome. Now while we've been talking Math Dad has been furiously recording questions from our chat so let's <laughs> okay. let's take a little time now to do some Q&A because we've had some outstanding questions come in. All right so you may have to no do problem. these Rapid fire, like one breath is all you get. Because I, I know that we could ask a lot deeper. So first of all, the, the chat is totally crushing on your accent. They they, they like, like the way you speak. So, <laughs> so and again, in case people missed it, where are you from, Sam? I'm from England in the UK. Nice. All right. So do underwater volcanoes send out water or lava or both? Like what, what's What's going on there? So under, underwater volcanoes are erupting magma. They're erupting magma as lava out into the water column. If you go to hydrothermal vents, maybe around volcanoes, they might be pumping out really, really hot fluids mm -hmm. and water out into the water that are filled with minerals and uh, heavy metals and all sorts of material. But volcanoes will still erupt magma and lava like we see on land. Excellent. Do you have a favorite volcano? Oh, I always get asked the favorite volcano question. <laughs> um, I will say generally, no, I don't have a favorite volcano. There are many that are really fascinating, but I have a really special connection to the one that I studied for my PhD, which is this one called Havre off the coast of New Zealand. So we'll call that my favorite volcano. All right. What's your favorite part of the job? Um, the range of things that you can do within this, how what no two how no two days can potentially be the same. One day you might be doing field work, the other day you might be analyzing samples in a lab, 
Another day, you might be at a conference presenting your results to your field of science. Other days, you might be doing talks at schools or talks like this. So really, the range of things you get to do within the job is my favorite thing. Excellent. Like who pays you to do this? I assume there's some money involved. <laughs> uh, yeah, some, uh, most volcanologists are employed by universities as researchers and or lecturers, or you might work for an institution like a museum or for a volcano observatory, like the, the main one you have in the US, you have the United States Geological Survey. And within the USGS, you have different volcano observatories around the country. So there's the California Volcano Observatory, Cascades, Alaska, uh, Yellowstone, and Hawaii. All right, what volcano movie is the most accurate? <laughs> oh my, I, I could get into trouble for, <laughs> for what I say here. <laughs> I will say that um, I really enjoy watching Dante's Peak. <laughs> <laughs> Dante's Peak is probably one of the ones I enjoy watching most when it when, when the explosive eruption is happening and sitting there and being satisfied by how the pyroclastic flow is being depicted. Nice. <laughs> I like that one too. But that's not to say I don't enjoy watching other volcano disaster movies and nitpicking at the science. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, are you sometimes scared of volcanoes? That's a question that came up several times. Okay. Um, you have to have um, an active level of fear and awareness when you're doing field work in the, these locations. If you're not scared, then you're going to be potentially reckless or you're going to put yourself in danger or put someone else in danger. So you have to have a healthy fear of volcanoes. They, they can be potentially very dangerous, but as long as you take the right precautions, you've got the right equipment and you've got people around you and you've got the right monitoring equipment, then field work can be made safer and easier. And how do you predict when a volcano is going to erupt? Because I imagine like the, the USGS stations, you know, in California and Hawaii and Yellowstone and Alaska, that's one of their main jobs, right, is trying to be able to predict and warn people. And that happened with Mount St. Helens in 1980. They were able to say it's going to erupt, get out of the area, and most people were able to get out. And because of that, the casualties were way lower than they would have been. Exactly. Yeah. Being able to predict when a volcano will erupt is a very, very difficult area of science. So one of the things we can do primarily is understand what the volcano is doing at that moment and look back across the past record and so there's lots of different things you can look at to do that you've got um earthquakes you've got the amount of gas uh, that might be uh, just passively leaving the system uh, volcanoes also breathe really slowly over time it's on a really really small scale like just a few centimeters or millimeters but you can have entire areas around a volcano that will slowly inflate and deflate over time and that can be the release of gas that can be new magma coming up into the system that causes it to inflate so we look at these patterns uh, like these breathing cycles we look at the number of earthquakes that might track magma moving up from deeper down in the crust and um, yeah so i've hit the main ones i think there with gas uh, the uplifts and also the the earthquakes but there's lots of other things we can do as well to monitor and predict volcanoes. Excellent. Um, are, are, are there female volcanologists? There are many female volcanologists. Um, I'm very, very proud of the number of women we do have in vol volcanology. It's really a fantastic area and it's increasing more as, as, as the years go on. So it's th there are some fantastic volcanologists out there. And I, what I will say if people are looking to um, uh, talk to or experience other volcanologists, what other volcanologists do. There's a really fantastic series on YouTube uh, with um, Dr. Janine Krippner, who is a volcanologist at the Smithsonian Museum. And she runs a, uh, a series called Volcano Moments. So if any of you are interested in uh, talking to other volcanologists and seeing what other people do in this field, check out Volcano Moments with Dr. Janine Krippner. And she runs a series where she has chats with volcanologists all over the globe who all study different areas of volcanology. Awesome. Nice. I will find that link and update our, our Patreon page in the description as well. So there's an easy link to that because that sounds fantastic. One more question. All right. Um, what makes an eruption stop? Ooh, uh, 
there's again it's not a a really simple answer that question in every volcano is different some eruptions will transition they might start off effusive and then turn explosive or they might start off explosive and turn effusive so there's transitions in style that can happen within a single eruption but what makes a, an eruption stop mainly it's a supply of material so you'll only have a certain amount of magma and melts and bubbles down below that are actually able to feed an eruption. So I'm trying to think of an example. Um, well, if, if you think about a Coca-Cola bottle that you've shaken up, you've shaken up and you yeah. erupt out the top, the, the eruption is only going to last as long as you have material available to erupt out of the Coke bottle. So once all of that gas has left the system, what gets left over is all the liquid down below. So with volcanic eruptions, once most of the gas and the melt has left the system, you might just get a lot of the crystals that are left over. And you can see that sometimes happening in eruptions where towards the end, at the beginning, it might be erupting out the really, really runny hot lava with very few crystals in and lots of bubbles. And towards the end of the eruption, the magma and lava has become a lot more full of crystals with less gas. Oh, that's cool. cool. Yeah. We have, um, I made a model volcano that we're going to set off in just oh. a, a moment. But first, Math Dad has oh, a God. quick um, math mystery that he's going to share. So we're going to, we're gonna, I'm going to hide, hide Sam from our screen for just a second. We'll share our math mystery. Then we're going to set off our volcanoes and we'll have time for just a little more Q&A before we finish after we do our volcanoes. Cool. So we'll, no we'll be right back in just a second. All right. Yesterday, I just kind of threw the math mystery at us because, as usual, we managed to forget something. So right here, I've got it displayed. The situation was that we had we had three thousand bananas. I'll maybe put them in three piles of one thousand here, and we had a camel that needed to transport the bananas over to the market, and it could haul as many as 1,000 at a time, but the problem was the camel would always eat one banana per, oh, I think it was kilometers, no, not miles, let's, let's get that right. We had to go 1,000 kilometers, but it would eat one banana every kilometer that it travels. So if it picks up 1,000 bananas and it walks 1,000 kilometers, it's going to eat 1,000 bananas and it will get to market with no bananas. So th this is a problem. And anytime it walks a kilometer, it, it eats one banana. So we have to always have a steady supply of bananas ready for this camel. Well, how many bananas can we get here? And the secret is to, to realize that the camel can be loaded or unloaded. So here's one possible way that we could get some bananas to market. What we could do is take 1,000 bananas and start walking. And then I'm just going to stop. At the 400 mile mark, the camel can unload 200 bananas and then walk backwards. Because along the way then, the camel would have eaten 400 bananas on the way out and 400 bananas on the way back. But now we have 200 bananas that have advanced part of the way. Well, we could try that same trick again. Take a thousand bananas, drop off 200 more, and then travel back. Aha, so now we have 400 bananas that have made it to the 400 mile mark here. All right, then finally, we load up, we head out. So we eat 400 bananas to this point, but then, aha, we could pick up 400 more bananas. So we pick up the bananas here and travel to the end. So we would eat 600 more bananas along the way, but that would leave us with 400 bananas at market. So my question for you guys is, what is the maximum number of bananas that this uh, camel can bring to market here? So we've already seen it's possible to get as many as 400 bananas to market. So my, my challenge for you over the weekend is to see if you can top 400. All right. All right. Now it is time for our volcano demo, and I'm really excited about this. When I was a kid, um, here, we'll turn it this way. 
When I was a kid, I remember being super excited to build a model volcano and then being pretty disappointed when it just, you know, kind of oozed out and ran like pink water down the side of my volcano. Um, so I came up with a better version and we're gonna set off the, the very safe version first and then we're gonna talk real quick about how to make a more exciting volcano and how to do it safely. So Math Dad, if you'll join me behind here All right. for our demo. I don't need to protect the laptop from spraying <laughs> lava. No. Okay. All right. So there's a real balance with science and I think with doing any research too, because if you're taking some risks, then things are exciting, but you need to be safe too. And being American, we tend to be overly concerned with litigation and covering, you know, making sure that, that we're being safe. But if you take that to an extreme, then you can make science pretty boring if you never take any risks at all and you never do any experiments where you don't know exactly what the outcome is going to be. Then you've made things, you've gone too far to one extreme. Should, so, we, should we be doing this outside? Um, the first one is very safe and you can do inside. Okay. So we have baking soda here and you can model a volcanic eruption by adding a bit of food coloring and adding some soap and vinegar. So actually put the soap in the vinegar because it'll mix together better. So here's our vinegar. We're adding some soap. And then when we pour in our vinegar, the soap is, then the vinegar is going to react mm. with our, with our baking soda. And we get this foamy pink quote unquote lava that emerges out of the bottle. And if we had was, built- Is that the same as our elephant toothpaste? No, oh. no, not the same as the elephant toothpaste because the gas that we're making here is carbon dioxide. Because when you have, baking soda and vinegar, they react together to make carbon dioxide and sodium acetate. And now we're getting this nice foamy reaction because we added soap that kind of captures some of that CO2 gas and you get a eruption. Now this was the version that I did when I was a kid and it was kind of fun to see, but I, I wanted something that was more dramatic. So I've made a more dramatic version of a volcano. And if you print the handout that goes along with today's episode of Quarantine, then you will see the very safe you can do inside version and the one where you need some safety precautions. The first safety precaution that you should have is to have gloves and eye protection. So I'm going to grab that real quick. And because we're short on time and because our internet connection is not the best if we go outside, I am doing this one indoors, but you should definitely do this one outdoors if you decide to do it. Also, because we are American and overly concerned with litigation, Math Dad and Science Mom are not responsible. If you injure yourselves, you're responsible for your own safety. Be smart as you do this. All right, more exciting demo. How does this one work? This one works by, and can you grab me the face shield as well? I think it's on the front couch. Oh. So I have put hydrogen peroxide into this volcano and a little bit of rubbing alcohol. You've got to be very careful not to do too much rubbing alcohol. Now rubbing alcohol is flammable, like all other types of alcohol. And so then when our foam comes out, because we have extra oxygen, the flammability of our rubbing alcohol is even more impressive. And those little bubbles of oxygen will give us some tiny little explosive, explosive action going on. Now I already put my rubbing alcohol and my hydrogen peroxide in just a quarter cup of each. And now I'm going to add the yeast, which is the catalyst and will cause the hydrogen peroxide to break down into oxygen gas. Can, can I just read the title of this for you? The fiery must be done outside with safety precautions volcano. Yes, but we are um, <laughs> sacrificing <laughs> our, our room for it. It'll be OK. OK, it'll be OK, Matt. Dad. <laughs> I, I will tell you that yesterday when I was when I was testing out the versions of this to come up because I wanted to make sure I got the right ratios. I did one with a little extra rubbing alcohol. It was very exciting. And Math Dad was having a meeting and he heard screams from the kitchen from my kids and came out and was like, what's going on? It was quite fun. Um, we also, and anytime you are doing anything with fire, you should have material on hand to put it out safely and quickly. If you have alcohol or oil that's on fire, you do not want to add water to it because the water will just spread those flammable molecules further. So I have baking soda and I also have a bucket of sand here. So that if the fire started spreading further than I wanted, I could just dump baking soda or sand on it to put it out. All right, I think that's enough talking. Are you guys ready? Yes. <laughs> Will you turn off the turn off that light? 
because then our fire will be more impressive. All right. Okay. Let me get my funnel here. And I'm going to put on my face mask and my gloves. And now the real test is going to be, can Science Mom light a match wearing gloves? Hopefully she can. Oh. Ah, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> you can go ahead and turn on the light now, Dad. Rubbing alcohol burns quite cleanly, and so we're not producing a lot of smoke because the, the alcohol burns pretty cleanly. Oh, and there was a little pop. Did you hear the pop? Oh, yes. And as, as the foam's coming out, those little bubbles of oxygen gas will give you some nice pops. And now it's done. So that's the fiery volcano version. <laughs> All right, and now we'll bring, bring Sam back on and do a little more Q and A before before we finish. So, <laughs> that was that realistic? Is that the way a volcano actually looks? <laughs> fire? Yeah. I, I would be fairly terrified if I saw an entire volcano physically on fire. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, yeah, really cool demonstration. Thank you, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. We had I had quite a bit of fun experimenting yesterday with different versions of fiery volcanoes, and that was. That was by far the safest, most um, family-friendly version that we came up with. But again, make sure that you are careful if you are doing anything with rubbing alcohol or other alcohols that are flammable because they can spread very quickly. All right, quick, uh, just a couple more Please. questions before you go, Sam. Can a volcano get so hot yep. that it melts itself? Okay, this is that. that's a really, really interesting question. Now, we talked earlier about different types of volcanoes, what they're made of, um, and that their chemistry is really, really important for their temperature. So at one end of the um, compositions of um, magmas, you get the more basalts kind of end. And those are the really, really hot types of lava that are uh, mostly made up of uh, magnesium, iron, and silicon. On the other side of it, you've got more really silica-rich volcanoes, but they've got very low amounts of magnesium and iron and they've got high amounts of um, sodium and potassium those kinds of things and those vol those types of magmas are a lot cooler so those erupt at around temperatures of maybe 700 to 900 degrees celsius whereas on the other side the basalts erupt at maybe temperatures around 1100 to 1200 degrees celsius so what you can have in some cases is you can have a magma chamber that's got lava that's got magma that's maybe erupted and then it's cooling down so this is an interesting fact that during volcanic eruptions usually most of the material in the magma um, reservoir doesn't erupt out so there's a large amount that is left over and that might be more crystal rich uh, than the stuff that's erupted out with bubbles and melts interesting um, but there's stuff that's left over behind in the magma chamber you don't just leave this big void um, in, in the earth, there's still a lot of material and lot, lots of crystals and melts that's not erupting out anymore, but it will slowly cool down over time. But what can happen is you can have fresh melts, fresh, really, really hot melt coming up into a system and it can remobilize and remelt some of that old system. And that happens quite a lot. So you end up mixing the old magma with the new, fresher, hotter magma. So in some ways, Yes, you can actually melt the inside of a volcano. You don't melt the entire volcano and it disappears off the face of the earth. <laughs> but what can happen is you can melt some of the crystals or the stuff that's cooler and you can actually, that magma can be used to cause in another eruption. Interesting. And those magmas might be the same chemistry and one's hot, one's cold, or you might have two different types of magma. You might have the more silica rich, uh, sodium and magnesium, uh, sorry, sodium and potassium rich magma, and then you and then you inject some basalt into the system, 
which is a lot hotter um, and a lot more fluid. And that might remobilize and remelt some of that old system. Nice. Another question. Do you, oh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I, I, there's a song that Math Dad sings every single time. <laughs> and we had several requests saying that Math Dad has to sing the song for Sam. I'm singing a song. I don't know the words. I don't know the words to this song. I'm singing it loud and I'm singing it long, but I don't know the words to this song. No, I don't know the words to this song. And now you get to declare or if you are in camp, big fan of the song or <laughs> camp, the song gets in my head and I'd rather not hear it again. So give us a thumbs up or thumbs down for the song and then you'll have a significant portion of the chat that will agree with you. <laughs> 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 Very good. We we are almost out of time. I'm just going to take three more questions real fast. And then okay. for, for everyone watching, in case I was not clear enough before, if you do the fiery volcano, it says here um, you must have adult supervision if you're doing it. And then really make sure that you follow the safety precautions and that you read all of the explanation about why it works and how you can take steps to make sure you do it safely. So, Sam, how many volcanoes are there on Earth? That's Real quick, quick questions, last three questions. Oh, I don't know that number off the top of my head because we have so many that we don't actually still know about yet. And most of those are on the sea floor or they're under glaciers. So they, they're under the ice sheet of Antarctica or the, um, the ice sheets in Iceland as well. But most of the volcanoes that we don't know about are on the sea floor. So we could be vastly underestimating the number of volcanoes there actually are on the planet. So mm -hmm. it's many more than hundreds, and it's many more than thousands. Ooh, but there's only a small portion. Yeah, there's only a small thousands. portion of them. Yeah, there's probably more likely millions of older features across the surface of the planet that are much older. Wow. Wow. That's and, awesome. also, and also, there are volcanoes that we will now never see because the oceanic crust has subducted under continental and other oceanic plates. So, so new volcanoes are, oh, sorry, new volcanoes are always being formed and then they're going dormant. So we have this cycle, right? Yeah. So the particular, so we might see on land some of these older expressions of really, really ancient volcanoes from hundreds of millions, possibly even billions of years ago. But on the seafloor, the seafloor, the oldest portion of our seafloor is only about 180 million years old. So before that, we actually don't know anything about that older oceanic crust. So there are probably many volcanoes that were on old crust on the surface of the ocean that we now no longer see because they got subducted down into the mantle. Fascinating. Um, how many years do you have to go to college to become a volcanologist? That's our second to last question. Okay. Uh, so depending on how long your, uh, your degree program is, usually a... You know, a bachelor's degree will take about four years uh, to do maybe a degree in geology. Uh, sometimes it will be called geoscience or earth science. Most of it comes under the same bracket and you'll learn the same subjects and do the same courses. And um, then sometimes you can take a master's that might take uh, one, two, three years, maybe. And then PhD afterwards. So anywhere between seven to ten years, maybe some somewhere within that range to go from to get a bachelor's, a master's, and a PhD. But in some cases, you don't necessarily have to have a PhD to be a volcanologist working for um, an institution or observatory. So sometimes you might go from there to working in industry. So there are many different paths to being a volcanologist. And not everybody is going to become a professor, but there are many different ways that you can be involved in volcanology. So, so there's, no, there's, there's no set timeline for any, every person is individual and everyone takes their own path but you can talk to those around you and do your research and uh, figure out the areas that might interest you the most. Excellent. And last, last question, very important. Several people in the chat want to know, do you have a pet? Do I have a pet? Um, unfortunately, no, I don't. I don't have a pet that I'm able to, to show you from where I am today. <laughs> if, you, if you did want to have a pet, um, we will end with our art showcase. Yesterday's art prompt was to make a okay. rock pet. So a rock. Yeah. Okay. 
I'm going to share share our screen real real quick, and we will go through about 15, 10 or 15 slides of our pet rocks. And while we're doing that, um, I just want to say again, thank you so much, Sam. I'm going to have you up on the screen here as well while we share, and you feel free to comment on these little no pet problem. rocks. But thank you so much for joining us. This was wonderful. Good. It's been really great. I've really enjoyed um, answering all of the questions you've been asking. Oh, look at some of these. These are brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> there are some pet rock singing songs. Lots of great eyes. <laughs> Way to go, Isabella from um, South Dakota. There's a, whole, there's a whole band there. These are brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> We've got some Pikachu then, rocks. Well, we've got rock Pokemon now as well. Brilliant. That's right. <laughs> I like the background for this one. Sorry, I know I'm going through these kind of fast today, you guys, but we're almost out of time. A whole rock family here. Fantastic. You could have a turtle rock, Sam. This could be your new pet. Yeah. No, that's that's good. It's a combination of on land and, and in the ocean as well. That's right. Just like volcanoes can be on land or in the ocean. Exactly. Aw. <laughs> These are all fantastic. <laughs> I love the eyelashes oh, yeah. on that previous one. I went through it kind of quick, but do you see how it's got those big eyelashes? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very creative. These are a and, lot more creative than I probably would have been. And here we'll end with one who agrees with me about the song. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> All right. In the chat, please give give it up for Sam. Thank you again for coming on. And just at the end here, real quick, I'm going to throw up your um, your Instagram handle and just remind everybody that if they would like to see more about volcanoes, about the importance of science communication and research, your Instagram page has some great material there that they can find. And I will be updating the description with the Smithsonian, um, the series from Janine, Dr. Janine Krippner, The Volcano yep. Moments of the Smithsonian, because that sounds like a fantastic thing to follow up with as well if you're interested in volcanoes. All right, yes. I will be back in a little over five minutes with Painting with a Scientist. We are going to talk about the super volcano of Yellowstone and paint a picture for that. So if you'd like to join me for that, you can. Once again, thank right. you, Sam. And we will see you all next week. Okay. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Bye.